Good morning. I hope you're feeling wake up because this talk is going to put you to sleep. Uh, well, I hope not. Uh, this talk is going to be a little bit different from what you've been uh, having. The reason why is I'm not actually going to talk about marine science or UAVs or autonomous vehicles or anything. I'm basically going to present to you what is tech, uh, what are we doing, how we are handling data and visualization, what things we've been working on to uh, bring some stakeholders into a world that it's, it's HPC. It's not a typical uh, world for Earth sciences. So I'm going to go through that through the next hour and try to convince you that uh, it's a good way to, to go to HPC. Okay. So what is TAC? Well, we are a research center within the UT Austin. Um, we are part of the UT Austin. We are just a research center. We don't teach. Uh, and we have some of the largest HPC systems, high performance computing systems uh, in the world. Uh, in fact, uh, we have now launched STEMP2, which is the 12th uh, fastest supercomputer in the world, and the first one open to, to science. So everyone above us uh, actually is not open. It either belongs to China, the Chinese government, or it belongs to DOE and DOD. That's the Department of Energy and Defense. But we have a collection of, of systems that we use for, for HPC, right? Our traditional stakeholders, uh, the people that usually use these type of systems, are heavy duty uh, computational intensive uh, applications, users. Mainly physics, chemistry, duck discovery, things like that, where they launch a job and it will go and occupy a large portion of the system. It will run for hours, and at the end, they will get a result, OK? Just for you to have an idea what our data center looks like, um, let me see if this thing starts. Hmm. Let's play. Okay. So it was. Ah, see? Don't you hate PowerPoint? There you go. There you go. <clears throat> so Stampede is, is, is a large system. Uh, the size of it is basically a uh, football field. Uh, so we, we have a lot of uh, machines on it. We have a lot of space for storage. Um, we can go up to 18 petaflops. It means that we can do uh, two to the power of 19 uh, instructions per second, um, and so forth. Uh, this machine is typically used, uh, as I said, for physics, chemistry. That's the most of the workloads that we have. And beyond just running the system, we actually kind of um, try new techniques. So one of the systems that we have <clears throat> which is actually right there. It's called Ikari. It's a solar-powered uh, system. Um, energy is going to be one of the major bottlenecks for uh, moving forward with high-performance computing. And um, the test that we're running with, with Ikari is to see if we can find our other sources than uh, fossil fuels to, to run the system itself. Having said that, uh, since 2013, uh, we've been serving the community. Um, we are actually a lot older than that. Uh, but our previous system was launched in 2013. It was one of the largest ones. And we served the community, especially with, with high-performance high computing resources. So one of the numbers that is actually wrong there is that we're saying that we did 2 billion uh, processing hours. That's not correct. It's, it's now at uh, 3 billion. And this is US billion, so 3,000. Um, and we're basically funded by NSF. Um, our major source of funding is, is NSF, the National Science Foundation uh, from US. 
Uh, and what happens is uh, users typically go to NSF, request allocations in our systems, and we'll guide them through the process of actually running on the system, launching their processes, and so forth. So we serve a really large community of users. This is one of those examples. Uh, it's, it's one of our recent examples. Uh, we work with LIGO in the US to process their data uh, as they collect them from, from the um, observation data and filter it and try to look up for um, collision and gravitational waves. Uh, and we're not just there to serve uh, computing hours or to serve the supercomputer itself. Uh, the reason why I'm mentioning that this, this project is because there was a large cl collaboration between us and the LIGO team to actually modernize their code. Physicists are really odd ducks. The reason why is they tend to stick to what they know. And they traditionally are really, really uh, not forth, forthcoming in changing the way that they do computation. So some of their code is actually old. It was created in the end of the 70s, beginning of the 80s, where we had a single processor that had some uh, specific characteristics. Uh, and they haven't actually evolved. One of the largest discussions that we had with them is precision. It's something that we don't think about, but that, that they really care about is what precision is for them. And if uh, the new computation and the results that they're getting doesn't actually exactly match what they were running on the 80s, they say that it's not valid. So there was a large discussion about that. But in the end, and this is a viz, is it running? So this is actually the, a visualization of the first uh, collision that they detected, the first merger of the two black holes. And what you can see is the gravitational waves. We typically, when we see it on, on TV or for illustration purposes, we see a single wave, but it's actually a circular movement, uh, motion itself. Okay. So, what are the challenges today, and why are we talking about this? Although physics, chemistry um, are typical stakeholders of HPC, today we're seeing that there is a lot of changes coming forth, not only for physics and chemistry, but for other uh, research areas, like earth sciences, um, humanistics, everything that um, traditionally we were doing on a single PC, with the amount of data there is coming uh, forth, we are actually um, seeing a more need to go into large systems and actually use a HPC systems. Um, so we are kind of putting forth this idea that we need something like a server infrastructure. And I'll talk about what, what that is. Okay, sure. Oh, sure, fine. There's a line there. Cool. So as I've said, over the last decades, um, HPC has always been uh, typically for, um, for uh, uh, an instrument of science for physics, chemistry, and heavy computational duties. Uh, engineering is one of our major stakeholders, every time that we need to calculate an infrastructure of a building, it takes several hours. Right? But there's a lot of changes coming forward. Right? These are some of the topics that were valid in 2001. Um, and they are still valid today, but things are moving forward. Right? Um, because we need to increase uh, competitiveness and uh, look forward for uh, what is coming next, what, with all the techniques that are coming next. Um, <coughs> sorry. Uh, HPC has be, been becoming 
uh, a first stakeholder in, in research. Right? And one of the reasons because that's been going on is just that we are not just using it for simulation. Physics is a typical simulation environment. We have an equation, we want to know exactly what's going on with that equation, and we'll run it for hours to see what the model predicts. But one of the things that it's happening uh, is that we're actually getting more data into the system. We're actually collecting more observational data. We are connecting more uh, sensor networks. All of that is coming in, so we're kind of generating a, a big data problem. Right? And what do we do with that big data? So today, these are more or less the cornerstones uh, of research. Um, simulation is still a big candidate. Data visualization is becoming uh, a first-class citizen, if you want. Um, we need to see what's, what's behind the data. Uh, Data analysis and data mining with techniques like deep learning, which is uh, a buzzword today. Uh, everything goes into deep learning. Um, everyone wants to use deep learning, and most of them don't actually know what deep learning is. But in any case, uh, that's been going on. And another problem is we have a lot of data, but we don't know exactly what to do with it. We have a sharing problem, we don't know where to store it, we don't know where to put it. Um, and not only that, the problem is um, most of the time we don't actually reproduce what, what we're doing. Most of the research is done, it's done once, it's published, and everyone forgets about it. And if we go back and we want to validate the work, there's no, the data is no longer available, the code and the models are no longer available. So there's, there's a reuse and a reproducibility problem uh, coming along. So things are changing, right? Once upon a time, we used a single computer to, to do our research, our work. We stake to, to that, but things need to change. And they are going the progression of um, going to larger, larger scales uh, and so forth. So what's coming? Well, there's a tsunami of data coming in. Um, not only a tsunami, but actually several tsunamis coming in, uh, coming from every field that we are looking into. Uh, the reason why is today measuring things are no longer is no longer expensive, and I'm going to put no longer expensive between commas, but it's becoming cheaper uh, due to, to large scales and so forth. We are building larger and larger uh, sens uh, network sensors. We are increasing the resolution of that sensors. We are generating data at the speed of light. So we need to have some way of, of dealing with that. Not only that, but there's been an explosion in software, our predictive models. Um, a lot of research has been done in creating models for one purpose or another. Uh, things, uh, there are purpose build tools for, for almost everything that we can think of, uh, and the systems are becoming more and more complex. So the idea is that we need to somehow um, increase the adoption of, of these computational uh, tools, either for managing the data, for simulating, or even for repurposing and revalidating what, what we've done in the past. But this is the typical environment that we find, right? Everyone has their specific tool, everyone has their specific pipeline. Um, if I wanna use a collection of methods for 
uh, a specific purpose. Um, say, for instance, to analyze images from uh, an autonomous vehicle, I'll, I'll have to go through a painstaking uh, collection of tools just to do that. So the idea and what Tech has been working on really, really hard is twofold. One of them is to take all these tools, repurpose them, uh, modernize their code, make it suitable to run on an HPC system because of the scale of the data. And convert that system into something that the user can actually create a pipeline and uh, revalidate data, right? So instead of me going through several programs that I need, I'll create a single pipeline, I'll have my data somewhere published, and I'll bring it in and run it through that pipeline and get a result at the end. And do this in a really simple way. Try to make it as simple as, as we can make it. One of the buzzwords that has been talked in recent years is as a service, something as a service. So Tech coined the term science as a service. And the idea is that uh, have the system ready and have the tools ready and simple interfaces like web interfaces, for instance, and have them ready for you to use and for you to create your pipelines, for you to feed in your data uh, automatically and so forth. <coughs> and we're doing that, this is a old slide, sorry about that. But we're doing that by publishing some of the most used, uh, common used uh, tools like uh, Jupyter Notebooks, which is Python, uh, basically Python, and RStudio, which is statistics and so forth. And the other thing that we're doing is changing how we handle data, right? One of the idea one of the key obstacles that we have is that most of the users or most of the researchers are not willing to share data. And when I mean they are not willing to share data, they are not willing to share data until it's published. I'm doing my research, my data, my data is critical to my research, I'm not going to publish that. And that creates a problem. Because when it's published, well, I really don't care about the data anymore, so it's gonna get stuck somewhere in some server or in some cloud system and it's gonna be forgotten. Someone comes along and says, well, I really wanna use that, the data from that research. How can I go back and pick it up? It's gonna send an email to the researcher and he goes, well, it was one of my PhD students that did that research and I don't know anymore what it is, right? So one of the things that we're trying to do is try to convince researchers that using methods like cloud uh, storage where they control their own data and through specific interfaces and APIs that we've been developing they can just manage the data and say when the data is public or not. Okay. And the other idea is, well, I'm a really good expert in HPC. Uh, my background is computer engineering. My master's is in um, computer vision. Uh, my PhD is in heterogeneous platform programming, which is kind of a weird term, but I'm a really good, I, I have really good expertise in, in computer science. I don't know anything about anything else. I know a little bit of physics, and I've kind of started looking into uh, control systems for a specific reason, but beyond that point, I don't know anything. 
someone from biology knows a lot from biology, doesn't know anything from research, from the computer science world. And for them to come up with software to run on this type of platforms or to even use the local computer efficiently is extremely hard. So our idea is to break these two. Once someone publishes uh, the application on our cl cloud system, we can go in and say, here's how we optimize your code. Here's how you take advantage of your infrastructure. Here's how you can run it efficiently. And here's how you can actually make it useful for other researchers. And that's basically what, what the tag team does. Uh, most of us are experts in computer science. Some of us are actually from other fields. Um, we have astronomers. We have a marine biologist, for instance. Um, we have people from humanistics that kind of create and bridge uh, the interface between us computer science or geeks and really cool people that do a really cool, interesting stuff. And what we are proposing is that um, we don't just deliver hardware and computing hours. We actually deliver uh, a whole set of other um, uh, topics around it to make life easier for researchers. And this is the idea that I was talking about. So it's kind of a three system layer where everyone that is working on the field uh, doesn't actually need to know anything about computer science for his program to, to be efficient. For us to take advantage of the resources that we have to manage it better and to even apply techniques that they don't typically know. Okay, so we're trying to, to expose that, these three layers uh, through that system. Here's an example of something that one of the projects that we, we worked on, um, it's a drug discovery portal we worked with uh, biochemistry specifically where um, they created a benchmark for uh, uh, and data sets for, for a lot of, uh, of their research. We went in with them and optimized their code, streamlined the data, m ensure that everything was working correctly and the result is it became one of the major tools for drug discovery in in the US. So everyone that really wants to test something uh, else can go into the portal, put in their structure, their protein, their molecule, and has a collection of tools that they can go through and actually produce a result. And if they want to change one of the tools, they can go and publish their own code as it is, and someone will come in and say, well, it's not efficient, we'll optimize it and so forth. The same thing for uh, gene discovery. This is actually an open sci a science project. Um, it's available online, so you can go in if you wanna try it out. And what we, uh, it, it works two prongs. Uh, it, it has, um, specific computational tools to uh, look for new genes, but it also has a collection and a whole set of, of data available that can be reused for, for new research. And when things work correctly, and this three tiers is working um, as we expect, Sometimes what we find is surprising. Um, 
the best model up to a couple of years ago uh, that would forecast hail uh, on, on storms uh, was about two hours. There was a two hour warning for hail formation um, within the US. By using this type of approach where you're bringing in specialists from other fields and computer science into the fold to optimize resources and so forth and to predict models, uh, that forecast was actually extended to 24 hours. So right now, Florida can actually predict a hill within 24 hours gaps. Not only that, but when this thing actually works uh, correctly, um, we can scale up. We are not just limited to our data set that lives on our basement server somewhere, or it lives on the cloud uh, system. We are actually sharing data and uh, connecting all these uh, joint uh, until now uh, data structures. And we can uh, increase the potential of research and discovery. Right. Uh, I plant and cybers were actually the the father and the mother, the two projects that generated this kind of approach. Uh, I plant was uh, a project for a genomic discovery with uh, UK. Uh, they mapped up the sequence of uh, several variations of corn. Um, it was our uh, first project on, on, on it. And uh, Cyverse is more of a um, hazard uh, simulation. So that's one of the reasons why it's using uh, not only ground stations, but also uh, remote sensing, specifically satellite data, to actually predict uh, new trends and new uh, patterns of uh, <clears throat> not only wind, but cold fronts and so forth. Um, and one of the outcomes of, of, of Cybers was that by looking at the data and by uh, us integrating sources from several um, components, we're actually able to, to make a significant impact in predicting things, specifically in the US. Um, but we were able to predict storms and predict um, uh, health, potentially health hazards and so forth, uh, which became this thing called Design Safe. Uh, Design Safe is now, combines now a lot of information. It combines satellite data, it combines hydrographic data within the US, uh, it combines um, tectonic plates, um, I'm trying to, to recall all the sources, but it, there, there are many. Anything that you can think that can potentially make uh, an hazard be an hazard is being integrated into this platform. Uh, ocean currents, everything is there. The idea is that by doing that, I'm enabling the research community to go in and access the data and access the tools and be able to use the, the HPC infrastructure, we can um, increase uh, response, even to the community itself, right? Because we're no longer, no longer just looking at the local scale, what's happening right next to me, I'm actually looking at a regional scale, and in some cases, for geologists, for instance, I'm looking at the micro scale. So we are integrating all that data into a single uh, platform where researchers can go in and not only reuse what others did, but also create their own uh, system and create their own predictable models and so forth. Okay, so 
that's the idea behind um, behind what TAC is doing. And this is what I think is going to be a, a major benefit for Earth, Earth Sciences. Um, I've been working with, with some researchers with a project that's been promoted by, by the Portuguese minister. And one of the things that they want to do is actually do this integration at scale to enable people to go in and actually share their research, share their data. Uh, one of the biggest economic factors moving forward in science is going to be data. And you guys are going to generate a lot of it. Uh, on that project, one of the things that it's on the table is creating a major network of, of sensors, not only for the Atlantic, uh, with buoys and so forth, uh, integrating uh, weather stations and so forth, but also integrating satellite data and unmanned um, vehicles to gather data within, within the Atlantic itself. The amount of information that's going to be available is going to be astonishing. Doing that on your local system is going to be absolutely impossible. And if you guys want to use techniques like, uh, I'm forgetting your name, sorry. I was going to talk about and this afternoon, like deep learning, you don't have any chance other than to scale up and actually go into large data sets and go into large uh, HPC systems. And now I'm going to shift a little bit and talk about what I'm passionate about. Uh, I'm a computer graphics guy, uh, HPC computer graphics, or high performance graphics. Uh, and when we talk about science, we always talk about showing up the results and looking into data. 30% of our brain is actually dedicated to vision. We are able to recognize patterns at the speed of light. But we are only able to do that if we can actually see what's, what's in the data, right? Typically, what we get out of a simulation, a network of sensors is just numbers. They don't show up anything, right? So one of the things that TAC has been employing, and it's actually the second largest team, is visualization. Develop techniques, new techniques, or bringing in uh, techniques from other fields into uh, the scientific world and to scientific visualization. Okay, we have a couple of systems. Um, we have a really large room uh, full of uh, neat toys. Uh, one of them is um, we were one of the first people, uh, one of the first labs to have actually the Oculus. Uh, it was the third prototype that they created. Uh, they sent it to us for, for trial. And the idea is, can we use um, 3D immersion to communicate visualization, and to communicate science? Uh, not only that, but we're playing around with touch systems, uh, interactive systems, and so forth. We have a really large uh, tile display system. It's able to project a single image of 380 megapixels. So think about collect, uh, joining in 380 iPhones and you'll have the resolution of, of the screen. And the idea of the big screen is that you can look into data and you can look into detail, but you don't lose the context of, of the entire uh, scene that you're visualizing. Um, and we're actually playing with another system, which is called, we're calling Rattler, uh, which is a similar system. It's a tile display but we can actually change the configuration of, of the screen itself. We can create a complete uh, enclosing circle around us to visualize data and create some real, really large schemes. But one of the things that we're worried about is how do we deliver remote visualization? How do we deliver uh, really compelling vis and really insightful vis to researchers that are not in our facilities, that are outside of it. And this is what typically happens, right? We'll have a model, we'll run it through 
crunch that model through our HPC system. It will run for hours. At the end, it will produce some results, and they will write it to disk. This is all fine and dandy, but in the end, the problem is this one, at speed. Unfortunately, there's no way that we can break the, some rules of physics. Uh, and with the technology that we have now, if I'm looking to large data sets, and depending on the technology that I'm uh, looking at, if I need to write out a petabyte of data, I'm looking at one day. And you may think that this is not a, an actual problem. It's just eh. writing. I, I'm not going to write a petabyte of data. It's not going to be a problem. Well, there is a group out of Cambridge University, which is actually, it, it's physics. But in any case, their simulation runs, it takes about two hours to run. Uh, crunching through their entire model, it takes about two hours. At the end of two hours, they need to write data to disk. It takes two weeks to write the data to, to, to disk. Okay. Uh, surprisingly enough, that's, that's exactly what's happening. Um, it takes more time to store the data that they get than to actually compute the data. And once the data is written to disk, what typically happens is users will go there, will use um, some tool, generate geometry out of it, uh, run it uh, to a display, either our tile display or just your personal laptop, and once again, write to disk. And once it's done, we'll, we'll write to disk. Okay. And this thing is going to iterate over, over time, right? If I have time steps, this, this is what I'm going to do. Uh, read the data, bring it in, run some algorithm to generate geometry so that I can see things, send it to display or to disk, and so forth. But once again, we, we're hitting into this bottleneck. If I'm writing, uh, and if, I, if I'm generating really large scale visualization, with high resolution, high detail, I still need to write it somewhere. And once again, uh, the bottleneck of speed and the laws of physics don't allow me to, to go there. So the question is, well, how can I break the cycle? I can no longer do um, high frequency writes. I cannot run my simulation or I cannot collect my simulation and continue writing to disk uh, as we can. So we need some other solution. And the other solution right now is, how can I write less to disk? <coughs> and the idea comes in as a thing called in situ vis, which is, I'm going to try to not write the entire data. I'm going to write exactly what I need. And in terms of this, that means that I'm going to be in the loop. Instead of waiting for my simulation to end or for my entire data set to be collected, I'm going to run a specific set of tools within the data itself and generate that, that data out uh, as I go along. And we have been working on that a lot. Uh, one of the problems that we had is, well, when you're talking about visualization, you usually talk about graphics, uh, um, graphic cards, right? The latest NVIDIA, the latest AMD uh, card that you can find uh, to generate your, your final image. Um, that's one of the, the things behind it. One of the things that we've been doing at Tech with some of our industry partners is to change that, to remove that restraint of actually ha having to have a graphics card in the pipeline and actually using everything that the machine has. If it has a graphics card, we'll use it. If it doesn't, um, we'll use the CPU that we, are, we have available. 
for the HPC, for the exascale problem, that is my CS problem that I have, uh, that means that I can use less powerful uh, things to generate the data that I need. And we started working with that on our previous machine, which was Tempeed 1. Uh, we worked with specifically Intel, which is one of the, our vendors, to create a thing that it's called uh, software rasterizer. For you, it doesn't mean anything, but it's the thing that generates your image in the screen. Right? When you're looking into um, a 3D object, all the data that's being generated is being generated through this technique. Every single software that you use to visualize data is actually being used by, uh, is using somewhere this type of technique. Okay. So we, we worked with them to remove the graphics card and say, well, we can use anything that it's available. Uh, any kind of processor that's available we'll, we'll use to, to, to see that this. And the other thing that we did was to bring in other techniques that were not, uh, that were not available on, on traditional visualization software. And Osprey is actually an example of that. And we'll talk about it in a few minutes. And not only that, the other problem is how do we scale up? How do we go from uh, an image from a file that is uh, a one gig file to something that it's a pentabyte of data. It won't fit on a single. Pro uh, it won't fit on a single machine. It needs to fit in several machines. How do we solve that problem? Right. And I'm gonna skip that. No, actually not. So we we work closely on that. Some of the tools that we've been changing is things like Visit, uh, which is a traditional scientific visualization tool, to actually use these new techniques and modify them to, to work correctly. Not only that, but again, going to the science as a service, we've been changing the way that we deliver uh, uh, the tools, mainly through portals, uh, VNC sessions, and so forth. So what is new? Well, even if you go back to the previous visualization software, if you were doing a simulation like the one that we're looking at, which is basically a two fluids mixing, uh, it's a simulation of two fluids uh, uh, interacting with each other, you have this what this would be exactly what, what your um, software would produce, right? You can see a couple of things, right? You can see that there's some structures, there's some dendrites coming in from both liquids, so forth. Uh, the two liquids are falling, uh, falling actually, so there's some interaction and some convexity on it. But there's a lack of something, right? Uh, it seems like a flat image. So, one of the things that we're bringing in is not only the ability to handle large data sets, but also to create more compelling uh, visualization and more uh, interesting uh, structures, right? So one of the things that, we, that you are almost not able to see is that actually in the middle, there's a little bit of a cone that you are able to see uh, on this image. And this is a typical thing in Viz Talks. It looks better on my computer. Uh, but the level of detail that you can actually see on the image itself, it's a lot larger than you were able to see on, on, a sing, on the previous uh, type of visualization. And it's only possible because we are actually scaling up. We are actually going to HPC systems, and so we are able to spend more time um, spend more resources uh, in actually creating the visit itself. Uh, the same type of thing, um, this is for uh, South Florida. Uh, South Florida was um, concerned about their uh, water reservoirs, 
So they did a, a large study um, of their uh, water reservoirs, uh, and they wanted to study how it interacts with their ground. So they took a lot of uh, core samples, took some tax scans, went to the HPC system, ran a simulation of water th going through the core to determine what was the velocity of it, so forth. And this was the result. So what you actually see in, in yellow uh, is the core sample itself. What you're seeing in blue is a simulation of uh, water flowing through the core, right? Once again, traditional techniques will allow you to, to see uh, what is going on. The, the shades of blue uh, within the streamline that you're seeing gives you an idea of uh, the speed uh, at that point. If it's more blue, uh, it's gonna be slower. If it's wider, it's gonna be faster. But you lose some perspective for what actually is going on on the rock, right? And when you go into techniques like uh, ray tracing and high fidelity viz, you can scale up, increase the resolution, but you can also give uh, a feeling of what the actual rock looks like, right? There's a lot of cavities and the porosity of the rock itself. All of that uh, can come in and uh, be brought in to, to the loop. And the same thing for, uh, for uh, chemistry, um, where we're actually looking for a specific uh, portion of the molecule itself. That's what we're looking for to be attached. And when you apply certain techniques, in this case, it's an augmentation with a technique called volume ray tracing. Uh, we can actually identify exactly the sections that we're looking without losing the entire context, without having to break uh, the model itself. And coming into earth sciences, so we are bringing this type of techniques into some uh, of the observations that we're looking at. Uh, some of you may recognize this. This is the current of the agulhas uh, in, in South Africa. It generates some swirls uh, around the Cape. And this is actually a simulation. It's a five by five uh, kilometer grid simulation out of Los Alamos. And once they, they computed the, the set itself, um, they, they looked at, um, at the data, they created the usual uh, projection, which is just a flat 2D uh, perspective of the scene. And um, they were kind of wanting to know exactly what was the interaction between the, the current itself and the topology of the bed entry of, of the ocean floor. Around, around the Cape. So, let's see if this works. The model here. Ah. Can't anyway, I'm gonna try to speak it on, on top of this. So at the end, what was produced was um, a movie for actually communication between Los Alamos and, and us. And the idea was to communicate the results at the end. Okay. So I'm gonna let him speak. change 
the warming climate, affecting weather patterns. For example, northern Europe is warmer than Canada due to the heat flux of the Gulf Stream. In a changing climate, the Arctic is predicted to experience large warming and more precipitation. This makes the waters of the North Atlantic warmer and less salty, which will likely weaken the Gulf Stream and impact global weather patterns. The Gulf Stream is part of a larger circulation pattern called the Atlantic Meridional Overturning Circulation, where warm waters move northward at the surface, sink near the Arctic, and return as cold water in the deep Atlantic. Based on models and observations, it is very likely that this circulation will weaken over the 21st century. Why do we need supercomputers for climate simulations? Ocean dynamics are composed of the mean component and the eddy component. The mean component is the average flow, typically illustrated as ocean currents on diagrams. The eddy component includes turbulent structures that vary in space and time, such as the eddies and the ambient currents shown here. Heat, salt, and nutrients are transported by both the mean and eddy components. In many places, the eddy component is as large as the mean may be in the opposite direction. High resolution simulations are required for the eddy component and enable us to understand the spectrum of turbulence and the impact of mesoscale variability. For a new ocean model to be trusted by the scientific community, it must be thoroughly validated. MPAS Ocean was run through an exhaustive suite of tests from very simple idealized domains that isolate a subset of the model physics to full global simulations driven by historical atmospheric forcing. These are compared to exact solutions, other ocean models, and historical observations. Real-world validation includes comparisons of the mean currents against observations from satellites and ships. We also compare any characteristics in the model against satellite observations of ocean eddies. There are several variables that we typically visualize in ocean simulations. Temperature differences from the equator to the poles are a major driver of ocean currents. These currents move warm waters towards the poles. This can be clearly seen by the Gulf Stream in the Atlantic Ocean and the Kuroshio Current beside Japan in the Pacific Ocean. Kinetic energy shows the speed of the ocean. Currents like the Gulf Stream and the Kuroshio appear as meandering flows spawning eddies on either side. The Gullis Current runs south from Madagascar. At the southern tip of Africa, it turns back on itself, a feature known as the Gullis Retroflection. This current regularly extends westward and pinches off eddies. These Agullus rings are the largest eddies in the ocean, spanning two to three hundred kilometers in diameter. They move as coherent structures all the way across the Atlantic, from Africa to South America. Ocean models are needed to understand and respond to climate change over the coming decades. High resolution is required for an accurate representation of the ocean, and this relies on high-performance computing. High quality visualization is critical to provide scientists, policymakers, and the public with insight from the huge amount of data produced by these simulations. So, this is the type of work that we do. I don't know anything about oceanography don't 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 even ask uh, I know a lot about HPC and a lot about um, about uh, visualization but beyond that point it's nothing to me uh, this is another project that we did again uh, curiously enough with with Los Alamos uh, and it's uh, an asteroid impact right uh, the idea was to simulate what happens if, if an asteroid will hit uh, the ocean, uh, uh, the Pacific, a couple of miles out of Seattle. Um, Coastline would be devastating, causing severe flooding, destructive shockwaves in the air, high 
understand these threats, NASA held the second international workshop on asteroid threat assessment, focusing on asteroid generating tsunamis. As part of this effort, scientists from Los Alamos National Laboratory are using high performance computing to investigate how an asteroid's kinetic energy is transferred to the atmosphere and ocean. Los Alamos scientists ran an ensemble of three simulations during the asteroid size, the angle of impact, and whether or not the asteroid exploded in an airburst before impact. The height of this airburst was also varied. We used X ray, a parallel multi physics Eulerian hydrodynamics code. X ray uses adaptive microfinement to continually subdivide computational cells in important areas, applying more computing power to where it's needed. Our simulations contain three materials a dissolved asteroid, static air, and static water. Initially, all kinetic energy is assigned to the asteroid. By studying different runs from the ensemble, we see the effects of varying asteroid size, angle of impact, and airburst. Here, a light colored pressure wave shows the asteroid's effect on the atmosphere. In addition, a large plume of water rises from the largest asteroid impact. Clearly, more kinetic energy is transferred to the water in the simulation. Slicing through the data set reveals more detail. The largest impact simulation shows the development of a trench and crater and a large plume of water and water vapor. Here we see two cases varying asteroid size. On the right are plots showing the transfer of kinetic energy from the asteroid to the water and air. Pressure waves in both the air and water show differences in the transfer of kinetic energy. Colliding shock waves in the atmosphere and water, as well as the wind at the water surface, hinder the creation of a propagating wave. Here we see the difference in energy transfer with and without an airburst. Whether or not there is an airburst changes how much kinetic energy is transferred to the air and water. An airburst breaks the asteroid apart, so that much of it skims the surface of the water rather than slamming into it. For the same size of asteroid, this results in a much smaller effect on the ocean. Interestingly, there is a stronger wave of appearance in the direct impact simulation, but such an impact is more likely to create a tsunami because of the greater height of the splash. This may indicate that a tsunami is more likely to be formed during a direct impact than an airburst. Previous simulations had led us to believe that the opposite is true. A feature discovered through this visualization is the pressure enhancement upright of airburst impacts. Two pressure waves combine to create this, one from the asteroid and its trajectory, and one from the explosion when the asteroid material hits the water. This may affect wave propagation and will have to be studied. By visualizing just the water in an impact simulation, we can study the formation of this tsunami wave. Immediately upon impact, a trench and crater is created, and a splash curtain is thrown high into the air. Water rushes into the crater, forming a water jet, which can be several kilometers high. This jet collapses to form a rim wave, which is hundreds of meters high. A new water jet begins to form, which will in turn create a new rim wave, a process that continues for some time. Each of these rim waves has the potential to become a tsunami. A threat of equal importance is the plume of water and water vapor that is locked into the atmosphere. A large fraction of the asteroid's kinetic energy goes into vaporizing water to create the trend of the crater. Much of the water vapor is locked into the stratosphere, where it may linger for months to years. Because water vapor is a potent greenhouse gas, this may have significant effects on climate. It is critical to understand the quantity of behavior of this vapor in order to assess the threat it poses. Analysis and visualization of this ensemble of asteroid simulations is already bringing us new insights into the science of asteroid ocean impact. These visualizations provide new insights and help Los Alamos scientists communicate their findings to peers at the International Workshop on Asteroid Threat Assessment, focusing this year on asteroid generating tsunamis. Um, going forward. So um, there are other, other examples that we're working with, especially with climate change. So it's one of the, the themes that we're working closely lately. Uh, not only just uh, large simulations, but actually visualize, visualize, visualizing real data, right? Uh, this is an example of a T-storm and we're looking at the formation of the T-storm itself, but also all the wind patterns that it's being generated by, by the T-storm the uh, itself. 
and we can create visualizations like this, where we actually see more detail than uh, the typical uh, viz that we create um, is available, right? So there's a lot of streamlines uh, in this plot that tell you exactly where the wind is coming from, what it's going to, what is the actual velocity, um, what is the progress of particles through, through the T cell itself and the tornado, and so forth. And when you start combining all, all of these things, sometimes you find things that we're not expecting, right? Uh, in this particular case, uh, um, when the PhD student was actually looking to this particular picture, he found out something about, um, about the data that, would, that no one actually had seen before. Um, if you look at your top left, you actually see a green, uh, a gray structure curling around the system. That's actually a tornado that is forming itself. And we're now looking into other um, types of this, not just simulation, but actually real data, right? This is, um, this is a viz from uh, the Arctic, and what we're showing is actually information about uh, the ocean uh, waters around, around the Arctic, showing uh, salinity values uh, across uh, a span, right? Bluish is um, less salty, green, uh, red is, is salty, so we're seeing uh, a formation of salt wa uh, sweet water. Uh, on the top of the ocean. And I'll stay here and open up for questions. Thank you. Going to be computed. Transform it if it needs to be transformed. Run the software and show you the this. Two things can happen. One is the software package is interactive meaning it will pop up uh, a window for you to interact with the software. Um, the other thing is it's not. It's gonna generate the data and live it out. Um, for instance, if you are using, well, it's not public yet, well, it's gonna be, anyway. So there, there's a tool now that we have, we created for, um, for actually for weather. Um, it will crunch up the data. It will gather data from three different weather centers. Um, and by weather centers, I'm talking about NOAA and so forth. Uh, it will collect the models. It will go through the app. It will generate something like 2,000 uh, views of data. And it will write to a single file. And that's completely streamlined. So it's basically setting up a pipeline. It's, it's a simple interface uh, at best. Does that answer your question? Okay. Sure. So in the, uh, the discussion on the mm -hmm. was, uh, kind of a more of a throwaway phrase saying, oh, it's important that these models be valid. Yeah. So They, they are, if, if I understand correctly, and I might be mistaken, because I, I told you I don't know anything about it. I don't know anything about oceanography. I know a little bit about, about the project. Uh, they are doing two things. One, they are collecting data from satellite. So it's satellite data being collected, remote sensing. And I think for some of the spots, they, they are using buoys. Right? There's, there's a buoy system somewhere uh, on the south connecting Argentina, a part of it on the South, Afri uh, south America and another part on, on South Africa. Yeah. Question, and there's one at north. My question is more you know, relevant to the, the work that this, this uh, department does. Mm. Yes. Essentially, redo your a priori so that you can tune your model. 
Yes. 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 So, the, if I'm not, uh, the project itself was done with Storic Pass. Um, one thing that we're planning in right now, um, we we have not done it yet, uh, and I don't know anyone that's doing that right now. Um, is bringing in uh, in uh, real time data. Uh, into the system and continuous validating. It's always a uh, postdoc. Uh, we'll, we'll bring in the data a month later, someone will crunch it through and probably update the models and validate if they're, they're valid in that sense. Uh, it's not, I'm, 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 I'm focusing on your, on your in situ's uh, real time. I don't know anything that is real, real time. There's nothing that I'm aware of. There might be, but I'm not aware of. Okay. Sure. Sure. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so the platform itself does allow for that. Uh, if it's your control, right? Um, you're basically going to the platform and saying, here's my model, I'm gonna publish it. Uh, and I'm gonna create a, an ensemble of them, sure, and I'm gonna publish that. It's available, it, it becomes available. But it's always the, it always has to be the researcher doing that, right? Because once again, I, I do know a lot about computer science. I don't know anything about um, anything else. And in that sense, uh, if I'm doing an ensemble of models, I need someone, an expert, to validate that. It's just not a collect. It's just not a question of sticking them together and say, "Ha, it works." I'm I'm the greatest guy. It doesn't work. Uh, you need to have someone with expertise looking at it and saying, "Okay." It's, it's reasonable, right? Just a, like a practical question. Mm -hmm. If uh, someone wants to use the Windsor facility to, just to provide some, uh, some backup application, what do you do? Um, let me put it this way. Um, Right now, I think that on the Azure, uh, on the um, Design Safe, it's open to the public. Anyone can go in and request. Uh, everything else is more or less, uh, it's more or less stuck. If you are a US researcher, you can always ask NSF for resources. Um, are you Portuguese? Okay. In that sense, there's a resource that should be coming online on six months within Portugal um, that you can plug into, uh, that you can actually use. It's not us. It's going to be helped by us to, to, to deploy. Um, it should be coming online in June, July, so FCT should put out something for, for, alloc for resources allocation. That's, that's the best I can tell you. Everything else, I, I don't know. Uh, everything else, I don't know. But that's going to be implemented in Portugal, actually close to here in Braga. Sure. Right. 